Hello, everyone, and welcome to Software Architecture Monday. My name is Mark Richards, and in this lesson, number 165, we will continue with our journey by looking at event-driven architecture. You can get a listing of all my lessons at my website, developer2architect.com slash lessons. And from this area right here on my website, you can view the lessons or you can go to YouTube to view them as well. So here's our roadmap. We've come quite a long way in the past, well, gee, several months, I guess it's been now, with this group of lessons. Um, we're almost done with this particular series of, well, it was supposed to be eight, but I, I did add that one lesson back when, a couple months ago, a month and a half ago, uh, a 161, I think it was, about just clarifying some agility. But here, we're going to be looking at event-driven architecture now. Uh, event-driven architecture has, well, had quite an interesting story. Uh, first of all, it can be best described as an architecture style that asynchronously responds to events that are triggered in a particular system. And this is the whole idea about event-driven architecture. Different services or event processors trigger events and we respond to those events in the system. Everything's async. Event-driven architecture has had quite an interesting journey itself. It's not a new architecture style by no means. It's been around for several decades, as a matter of fact. Um, it's had quite an interesting ride in terms of the hype curve. Uh, the initial one was pretty high, uh, but it was fairly complex. And we didn't have a lot of tools, nor did we have understanding about how to process events in an effective way. And that hype curve went down into the trough of disillusionment. But then we got new techniques, new tools, and that started that hype curve again, which then went down. And actually, in my humble opinion, thanks to microservices, um, we're now back on this hype curve of event-driven architecture. It's not all contributed to microservices. It's also due to the increase in, well, the demands for non-deterministic systems, uh, the complexity that we have to deal with in the various pathways a user can take through our system. Uh, these are hard to manage, and event-driven architecture does it extremely well. well. Let's see some of the core aspects of event-driven before we look at its pros and cons. Event-driven architecture is really based upon either a uh, streaming broker or an event broker. Um, what this contains are event channels. This is not like in the prior lesson. Uh, notice we talked about that message bus. Uh, this is really just a dumb broker. Um, all it does really is accept events and send those events or make them available. So what we have are some formal terms I want to show you. Everything kicks off by something called an initiating event. Now that initiating event can come from external or it could be some sort of internal uh, event that happens or thing that happens. But this is the one event that kicks off all of the processing. And then we have something called event processors. Now that's a formal term, but in today's world, uh, we usually just call those, well, services. <laughs> now event processors or services, I'll just use the word services here on out, uh, generate something called what's now called a derived event. Notice this is a different color. Uh, formally, you'll see that these are called process events, but a derived event is what most cloud vendors have been tagging these as in the past couple of years. When an event processor does something, it advertises what it did to the rest of the system, and that's a derived event. It's based on something from the initiating event, and it sends it to the event channel, totally asynchronous, fire and forget. Is anybody interested in this event? While in fact, there's a lot of other services that want to respond to that. And they may in turn also trigger events, those derived events, which are then picked up by other event processors. And that's kind of how event-driven architecture actually works. Um, here's a good example of event-driven architecture from a happy path standpoint. Uh, this is a typical order entry site where we want to purchase a book. Notice that purchase book over here happens to be our initiating event. Now we've got all these different event processors or services, um, order placement, payment, fulfillment, shipping, notification, inventory, and warehouse. 
and notice all of the derived event. Order placement places an order, advertises it. it. says, hey, I just placed an order. Is anybody interested? Oh, payment, notification, and inventory are. And they, in turn, react and respond to that event and trigger more events that happen, that the inventory has been updated, which warehousing definitely is interested in that because they need to replenish the stock. <laughs> and this just starts proliferating throughout the entire system of all these different events <clears throat> that are being triggered and also then responded to. Okay, so let's get to the crux of the matter. When and when not to use event-driven architecture? Well, let's start with when to use it. You can see why it is so popular, especially today. Look at these five stars. Really good levels of abstraction, but notice here with that abstraction is where we get five stars for performance. How do you build high performance systems? Event-driven architecture with that asynchronous and parallel processing is the way. Also, scalability notice and fault tolerance, evolvability, elasticity, all of these are its superpowers. But isn't it interesting, and I'm going to erase all these again just to show you one interesting aspect, that in the last lesson, I talked about all that abstraction, uh, lowering performance. Well, because in a lot of cases, service-oriented architecture was synchronous in nature. The abstraction was good, but here, because we have that asynchronous parallel processing, we're able to abstract our requests and still get really high performance. So it's kind of an interesting story. But there's other times to use this, of course. High performance systems, highly elastic or highly scalable systems. Probably, um, well, I would have to say, yes, close to the best architecture style. Well, mm, I don't like to say the word best. Um, my friend Neil Ford has taught me not to say best when I refer to architecture. Because <laughs> everything's a trade-off. But uh, it's up there with microservices in terms of that high level of fault tolerance, which is why both are rated five stars, but for different reasons. Microservices had five stars for fault tolerance because when, when a service goes out, it's only one function. Event-driven gets its high fault tolerance because of the asynchronous nature. I'm not dependent on any other service for my processing, which means services can come up and down and it just doesn't matter. It'll be processed when you're available. And so also though, when to use it is if you have a particular domain problem, a business problem that deals with things, events that happen in the system, uh, defined contribution, defined, uh, uh, defined benefits systems, um, uh, uh, bidding auction systems. If I place a bid, it's not a request made to a system. It's an event that happens and a lot of things trigger off of that. So listen to the nature of your business problem. If you're saying events or the words triggered, then it's a good match with event-driven architecture. Well, with all these superpowers, is there a time not to use it? Oh yeah, this is pretty clear. <laughs> they are fairly complex, everybody, and simplicity only rates one star. Um, and that does translate, of course, to, to cost. But also these architectures, because of the asynchronous nature, are really hard to test. But the case studies of when or use cases of when not to use it extend beyond these. Uh, for example, if we need tight synchronization and consistency of our data with high data integrity, mm, not a good match with event-driven architecture. Um, also, if we've got most of our processing needs to be synchronous in nature, in other words, I place an order, but I have to pay for it while a, the user is waiting, and then I also have to decrement the inventory while the user is waiting, and I have to make sure that other things happen. Uh, this is not suited for event-driven. That's more of a request-driven architecture. Not, again, a good isomorphic match. But also, if we have the need to have high, tight control 
over the ordering of events that's extremely hard to do in event-driven architecture and something will usually slip through the cracks and so uh, deterministic systems uh, don't meld well with event-driven architecture non-determinic system non-determinic <laughs> let me say that again <laughs> non-deterministic systems do meld well so there you have it. That's event-driven architecture. And looking at the general star ratings, just collectively along a lot of the characteristics, we'll notice quite a few five stars. Uh, most of them, not surprisingly, involved with the operational architectural characteristics. Those things like scalability and performance and elasticity and fault tolerance. These things this architecture style does really, really well. All right, so this has been Lesson 165, Event-Driven Architecture. Everyone, we have one more lesson in our journey of these architecture styles. And I know it's been a long couple of months here uh, because this will be our ninth lesson in the next one uh, where we'll take a look at space-based architecture. And we'll see how that works and some of the pros and cons of that architecture style. So stay tuned in two weeks for our last architecture style journey lesson 166. Thank you so much for listening.